Amen. If you would now turn to page 15. Come thou fount of every blessing. I love that. That last verse, O to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. That, that last line, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. This world can pull a person, can draw us, and we have to just stay close to Jesus. Amen. And so let's sing this out. Come thou fount of every blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song, and sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger Wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, find my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Amen. Our last congregation will be page 61. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. We'll sing this out, and then our young people will come before Dad preaches. And uh, they've been practicing an old one. Dad requested some time ago a couple of our old songs will be pulled back out. So they'll be coming and doing Preacher, Tell Me Like It Is after Savior, Like a Shepherd, Lead Us. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us. For our use thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us, Thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us, Thine we are. We are Thine, do Thou befriend us, Be the guardian of our way. Keep thy flock from sin, defend us, seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and sinful though we be. Thou hast mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and power to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Blessed Jesus, Blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Early let us seek Thy favor, early let us do Thy will. Blessed Lord and only Savior, with Thy love our beings fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. Us. Thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, 
Thou hast loved us, love us still. Amen. While our young people are coming, go ahead, young people, make your way up here. <clears throat> I just wanted to mention something. I don't know if Dad had planned on mentioning it, but I've been mentioned, uh, had people mention to me about um, just Israel, the state of the world right now. I know that there's a lot of things we can't control, but we are told to pray uh, for, for the nation of Israel. I, you know, I, I want us to always be clear. We pray for everybody. The only one that wins in a war in some ways is the devil. When young people are dying, and many of them don't even know what's going on, uh, but there are definite, in my mind, prophetic implications of things that are going on right now. And it should ch challenge us to not just be in prayer for Israel, but to be in prayer for our country and to, uh, and to be, I believe, getting ready. There's only one person that's going to bring peace. Amen? And that's the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. So the kids tonight will sing Preacher, Tell Me Like It Is.
Well, amen. It's good. I sure appreciate our, our kids and uh, their desire to serve the Lord. And I love that old song, Preacher, Tell It Like It Is. I heard them practicing um, a little bit ago, and I was telling some of the ladies, it reminded me of many years ago. <clears throat> I'd been pastoring here for probably six months, and um, the sanctuary was just half this size. The pulpit was all the way back, and we had the three rows in the back, just like they are. And uh, so the pulpit was just a little ways from that first pew. And uh, I was doing then what I do now, which is all I know to do, which is open the Bible and preach. And um, I was just preaching my heart out, and there was a very, very elderly man sitting directly in front of me. And about 10 minutes into the message, he stood up and said, stop pointing at me. <laughs> well, what that told me was is the Spirit of God had just revealed to him where he was. Um, because have you ever sat in the pew? Now, I know I have many, many times. Uh, even now, as Pastor Clay preaches, as Brother Jim preached the other night, have you ever sat in the pew and felt like that the preacher had read your mail and that he had uh, seen all of your texts for the week uh, and that it was like the preacher was directing everything to you? If that's the case, you ought to praise God because the Holy Spirit loves you enough to deal personally with you through the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. So I want to take you this evening to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And while you're going there, I want to go ahead and give you a reminder. Um, I know that we've tried to get the Word out. Uh, there will be signs uh, in front of the ranch for the rest of the week reminding everybody uh, of the Roundup next Saturday evening at 6 o'clock. We're going to have a great time in the Lord. If you've never been to the Roundup, I can assure you it will not be a waste of time. Uh, you'll be able to hear the gospel. We're going to have great music and good fellowship. At the end of it, we're going to have a major fireworks display uh, and other explosive activities. Uh, and so we always let the Sheriff's Department know uh, the night of the roundup, so when the neighbors start calling uh, and reporting that there are explosions going on over at the Turner Ranch that the sheriff will always do. As a matter of fact, the sheriff will be there. Uh, and so uh, we're looking forward uh, to next Saturday evening. We will certainly have a great time uh, in the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you'll go ahead and stand with me. And uh, I want to read there, um, actually I was going to read just four verses. I think if you allow me, I'll go ahead and read the first nine verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, uh, just a quick word of background. The Corinthians, and Pastor Clay really, really kind of got on my message this morning. He actually made some statements that were exactly some of the things I had written down. But I know he did not read my notes because I didn't get my notes made until this morning. And so I know he didn't read my notes. I just believe that's the way the Spirit of God works. And so um, when we look at this passage, what we realize immediately is that there were some problems going on in the Corinthian church. Now, as we go through the book of 1 Corinthians, not like we're going to cover it all tonight... But what you'll find is there were various issues going on in the church. Uh, the first one that Paul addressed was divisions in the church or contention within that church body. And so I don't believe that he started out with divisions uh, just because. I believe that he started out with divisions because that is one of the most dangerous things in any church or any institution is divisions and contentions. Even in a family, it is disastrous when there is contention. And the Bible says only by pride comes contention. And so the Apostle Paul addresses this with the Corinthian believers. Uh, I want to make that clear with the Corinthian believers that there are some problems here and uh, we need to address the problems. Now, I'm going to get to the scripture, but you may say, well, preacher, are you, are you indicating that you see divisions in our church, in our body? And uh, let me just say this, I praise God that I do not. 
But I believe that it has been said, it's so true, prevention is always the best cure. And so oftentimes we get into a place of comfort, our comfort zone, to where everything is going good, everybody's loving one another. We have fellowship that is so good, and our church has that. The caution is this, do not get comfortable in that because the devil is like a roaring lion roaming around looking who, may, for who he may devour. And so when something is going good, you can be certain that the devil is planning something not so good and we need to be on guard for that. So that's the message this evening. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase." Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Do you remember what Pastor Clay preached this morning about fellowship, the joy we can have in fellowship together? Paul is making this plain. We are one. We are not many running here and there as uh, individuals, but we are a body fitly joined together. This is the point that he is making here. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse number 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, and ye are God's building. There's a word in verse number 9 that I want us to rehearse together just for a moment. He says, for we are laborers. Now let's all do that next word together. Together. We are laborers together, not divided, not with contentions, but we are laborers in the work of God together. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And anything that rises above that, any, any thought, we need to take that thought captive and realize that Satan is a destroyer. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. God, listen, he's come to save that which is lost and to grow us in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That should be the goal. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful to you. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for all you do for us. Lord, you daily loadeth us with benefits. God, you pour out blessings on us that we do not deserve. God, you love us when we are not lovable. You forgive us, God, when we do the same things over and over. And God, you forgive us, and we are grateful. And Father, I pray that if somebody's here tonight, they're not saved, that today, tonight would be the very moment, the very hour of salvation. But for those of us who are saved, God, help us to desire to live a life that you would describe as spiritual and not carnal. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Every day, at least every week, presents various things in our lives that remind us of where we need to be. I entitled the message tonight with a question, Where are you, spiritually speaking? Oftentimes, at the end of a church service and uh, you may think this is a little bit overbearing as a pastor, but I, I still have a tendency to do this. Um, when I look out at a congregation and I know that there's somebody that's generally here and they are not here, uh, it's not unusual when church is over for me to text you or maybe call you and, and ask a question. And generally, whatever way I choose to word it, generally what I'm trying to, the, what I'm asking is, where are you? 
Now, there are some people that in the past have got offended when I would ask, where are you? Because their attitude is, well, that's really none of your business. And I want you all to smile for a moment. And I do agree in the fact that no one has to give an account to pastor. If you all understand that, say amen. I understand that. You do not have to give an account to your pastors or to your Sunday morning Bible teachers. But if your Sunday morning Bible teacher or your pastor cares enough about you to ask where you are, how you respond to that question tells a whole lot about where you are. Not geographically, but spiritually. So I love to ask the question, where are you? Because the answer or the response really tells me what I want to hear. I don't really care. Now, pardon me. I don't really care where you are geographically. Now, I do like to know if you're sick at home. I do, like, I do care if you're in the hospital. I do care about those kind of things. But that's not the issue. The issue is where are we on a spiritual level. Now, I've given this illustration many times, but to bring everybody up to speed, I want to give this again. I'm at the hospitals a lot. Miss Deb and I will be at the hospital early in the morning. And it's not unusual in public buildings, where, especially where there are elevators, that when you get ready to get on the elevator, there'll be a little plaque there on the wall. And it is actually a diagram, a basic diagram of the exits and such as that at the particular building. And there'll be a little red dot and it says, you are here. How many of y'all have seen that? You are here. How many of you have ever backed away from that sign, threw a wall-eyed fit, broke the glass out of the plaque, and said, how dare you tell me where I am? But do you know that as a child of God, people back up, and they kick, and they blow snot, and they throw a big fit, because somebody had the audacity to say, brother, it appears to me that you're right here. Are we okay so far? For somebody to actually say, this is, it appears to me that this is where you are. As a body, that should be great encouragement to us. If a brother or sister in Christ came to you and said, brother, I love you, but it appears to me that, well, first of all, if his if his discernment is wrong, it should not offend you that he at least cared enough about you to ask. And if his discernment is right, it ought to bless you that he loves you enough to listen, even risk your friendship to try to get you from where you are to where you need to be. And that's what Paul was actually doing. He was saying, I would like to speak to you in a spiritual manner but I'm not able to speak to you in a, a spiritual manner. I'm having to feed you on the milk of the word because you're not ready to receive the meat of the word. And here are some of the reasons that I see that. And he begins to share with them some of the evidence that they were carnal and not spiritual. And one of them was that there were divisions in the church, and the Bible says that contention comes only through pride. Now, with that said, it should be the desire of every true believer to be more pleasing to our Lord every day. Now, listen, I know it's Sunday p.m., uh, and I know we started early this morning, but some of you guys just look flat dead tonight. I mean, you ought to see you from up here. It could be depressing, or you could help me and give me a little bit of encouragement. So if you're, if you're alive and saved and glad about that, just smile. You don't even have to yell amen. It help, but just, I mean, just look alive. Clay called me the other morning. He was dead. That bull out in the pasture beside my house is dead. And I said, uh, how do you know he's dead? He goes, he's dead, Dad. And I said, but how, how, how do you know he's dead? He goes, he ain't moving. He got no expression. He didn't come to the trough when we poured out the feed. He's dead, Dad. 
if you're saved, praise God you ain't dead. But would you all at least come to the trough because I'm getting ready to pour out the feed. Okay, just come to the trough and smile. I, you might say, preacher compared us to cows. Well, that's better than the donkey in the book of Numbers. And so y'all smile because Paul loved the Corinthian believers enough to tell them you're not even able to receive the meat of the word. That's why I'm having to feed you with milk. And he's very explicit about what was going on. And so I just want to share the principle with you. It should be the desire of every believer to be more pleasing to the Lord every day, to listen and be attentive to his word, whether words of encouragement or words of correction. You see, when we hear words of correction or reproof, according to 2 Timothy 3.16, the Bible says all Scripture is given for, from ins uh, inspiration of God. And, and I'll paraphrase, and the Word of God is good for reproof and correction and, and, and discipline. The Word of God is good. And so when we hear the words of correction and we find ourselves being angry or offended, it is a good judge, if you will, of where we are spiritually. Because the Bible says that this Word of God is the only thing that will make us fit for the kingdom's work. You see, when we hear the Word that we feel like is correction or reproof, and we rebel against that word or against the messenger, that is a sure sign of carnality. Now, I want, to, I want to say that again. When we hear the word of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit, that word of God is correcting us or that word of God is convicting us. Okay? I want to make sure you're with me. How many of you as a child of God have ever felt the correcting power of the Holy Spirit of God? That... that that internal, that, that Holy Spirit of God that abides in us. And as a child of God, you feel maybe through the preaching or the teaching or maybe, maybe just because you sat down and opened your Bible and read the Word of God that day and there was conviction there. God trying to get you to a place where you needed to be. If your reaction to that is rebellion, if your reaction to that is I don't like the message, and I don't like the messenger. That is a perfect indicator of where you are spiritually. And that is a state of carnality. And it is simply a sin, like any other sin, that is to be repented of. Proverbs 28, 13, the Bible says if we confess our sin, if we forsake our sin, we will have mercy. And so it is simply a sin. Carnality is a sin that needs to be repented of. I believe that Paul's heart was broken. I don't believe that Paul was angry. I believe that he actually loved the people there in Corinth and he wanted them to be in lockstep with God. But he saw that there were problems, there were divisions, there were contentions. There was moral laxity, if you will. They were just doing whatever the flesh told them to do. And Paul understood that and he wanted them to come out of that and to walk as spiritual and not as carnal. You see... I believe it would be timely for every true believer to pray a simple prayer that would go something like this, Lord, help us. Lord, help me to be a person led by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God. Proverbs 119, 105, the Bible says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Oftentimes, we need clear direction from God. The sad thing is most of the time we're afraid to ask for direction from God. I had an experience just yesterday. Some of y'all will laugh at this, but I actually stopped at Walmart. I love to stop at Walmart about once every two years. And I always get illustrations when I'm there. So actually I ran into one of our ladies at Walmart and she was like, what are you doing here? And I said, well, what are you doing here? 
I go in the back door at Walmart. That's where you buy tires and stuff. And, and I walked down the aisle, and I met three employees of Walmart, and all of them looked at me with an odd look, and all of them said, can we help you? But they didn't look at me like they did everybody else. Most people, they say, could I help you? But with me, they go, could I help you? And the third one, I said, do I look like I need help? And he goes, well, I've never seen you in here before, and you act like you don't know what you're looking for. He was just being honest. And I said, I came to get water. Where is the water? And he goes, it's a quarter of a mile that way. I didn't check it, but it was almost a quarter of a mile that way. All I'm saying is they could tell by looking at me that I didn't know where I was. And surely that I was not where I wanted to be. And I believe that we need to allow the Holy Spirit of God who never makes a mistake. And the Bible says he will lead us into all truth. Why would we not allow the Holy Spirit of God who never makes a mistake to take us by the hand, if you will, and lead us from where we are to where we need to be. And that's all Paul was saying. He was saying, I want you to be able to handle the meat of the Word of God. But you're here, and you need to be over here. So if you will, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you from where you are to where you need to be. What a powerful, powerful blessing from God. You see, he's, he's just simply trying to take the people from carnal to spiritual. Carnality raises its head in many, many ways. This message tonight, and I think Pastor Clay mentioned this this morning in his message, the message is not meant to be a message of condemnation, but rather encouragement, encouraging every believer to desire a spiritual life and not a carnal life. You see... Living a spirit-controlled life is not easy, especially in this chaotic and dark world. Proverbs, uh, Psalms chapter 2, the Bible says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine such a vain thing? Did you know that Pro, uh, Psalms chapter 2 asks a question, Why do the heathen rage? And I believe it's a timely question for what's going on in our culture, in our world today. Why does... It all just, why does the mainstream media rage against God? And, and why do people in powerful positions in our land today, why is it it's almost like there is this raging against God? And you, you wonder why. Well, the question was asked all the way back in Psalms chapter 2, why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine such a vain thing. And then it gives a little bit of answer there. Basically what it's saying is the people are saying, we do not want God to direct us in any way. Break the bands asunder. Do not restrain us. Do not direct us. Let us do our thing. Go our way. We do not want any direction from God. And that's what they were saying. The heathen raged against the authority of God. Guys, we live in a culture where authority has become a dirty word. But in Scripture, the, the very doctrine of biblical authority or the authority, the sovereignty of God is not something that binds us. It's something that frees us so that we can live, listen, without, with, listen, without the condemnation of this world. Authority has become a dirty word, but in fact, it is a safe place for every person to be. I want to read something to you. I, I, I knew try to read a lot, and I read something the other day that really caught my eye, and so I, I, I don't normally just read things to you, but I want to read something um, in some way here. It says, faithful Christian living becomes increasingly more difficult and more demanding. It is the furthest thing from a downhill ride. Christ does give us peace, joy, meaning, purpose, and many other blessings of which believers know nothing, unbelievers know nothing. But this is very important. But we will be in a battle. If you're a child of God, you will be in a battle 
from this day until the day the Lord Jesus takes us home, either through death or through the rapture. Get it straight. We are in a battle. And all God's people need to say, Amen. It's a spiritual battle, but we are not left helpless in the battle. He says, if you'll put on the whole armor of God... That whole armor of God. He's saying sin has no more dominion. Sin has no more control. Put on the whole armor of God and you can live a spiritual life and not a carnal life. Let me just say this. I think it's very important when people come to be saved. I had the opportunity to lead a man to Christ in my office just the other day. And I praise God for that. Those opportunities do not happen very often where somebody actually calls and said, Pastor, could I meet with you? And we meet. And he says, I'm lost. I need to get saved. But I was able to lead that man to Christ that day. Not anything of myself. I'll tell you what, he had heard the word of God. He's not here tonight. He wouldn't mind if I shared this, so I'm going to do it. You wouldn't know who he was anyway. I don't know what to compare anything to. I was raised in one church, I was there for 32 years, and I came to Lindsay Chapel, and I've been here for 38 years, and that is all my church experience. I've not been other places. Now, I read, and I listen, but I don't have a lot to compare to. I, all I know is that we open the Word of God, and we teach the Word of God, and we preach the Word of God, and we stop trying to be fancy and just be faithful, and God blesses. But that man said to me, he told me he was 58 years of age. I hope he's listening tonight. He said, Preacher, I'm lost. And I said, well, how did you come to that conclusion? That's interesting to me. I mean, 58 years old, and all of a sudden you realize that you're lost. What brought you to that conclusion? I also had this same conversation with another man this week. told me he was 56 years old. But both of them were here a few weeks ago when I preached a message, a simple, one of the most basic first grade messages that you could preach on repentance. And y'all remember the message on repentance? And he said this, he said, I'm lost. And he began to tell me about his life and he said, but I don't know what to do. But he said, I came the other day and you, you preached about repentance. He says, I hadn't heard anybody talk about repentance in forever. Now, you might say, well, where are you going with that? The other guy told me the same thing. And I just say this. The Apostle Paul loved the Corinthian believers. But he saw them in a place that was a detriment to their spiritual growth. He saw them in a place that was a hindrance to the church growing. He saw them in a place that was not fruitful, if you will. And he loved them enough to tell them. And what he was actually saying to them is you need to repent of your carnality. You got that word? Repent of your carnality. You can't get out of sin any other way than repenting. Did you know that turning over a new leaf is not the same as repentance? Did you know that forging a new path is not the same as repentance? If we have sin in our lives, and this is, this is the direction that Paul was giving. If we have sin in our lives, carnality, and the way that carnality manifests itself, which we'll talk about that a little bit later, the way out of that is through simple, honest repentance. God, forgive me. The Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And we move from where we are, carnality, to where God wants us to be, spiritual. And it comes through that act of repentance and saying, Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated to thee. And so the Apostle Paul was simply loving on the Corinthian believers but letting them know that where they were is not where they needed to be. Did you know that as a child of God, I've heard people say this to me, and though I do not like the way it sounds, it is true. I've had people that got saved six months or a year later, two or three years later, they would be having difficulty, and they would say, Preacher, life wasn't this difficult when I was lost. I mean, it was easier when I was lost. I don't like the way that sounds. 
but it is true. Because when you're lost, you're in perfect lockstep with the world. You're not, there's no friction, if you will. You're lost. You're hellbound, but you are lost. When you get saved and you get on that straight, straight gate and narrow way, that's when you begin to feel the opposition. Are y'all following me? That's when you begin to feel the opposition. And the pressure of this world is like trying to paddle your boat upstream. And what you'll find if you try to paddle your boat upstream is you may be able to move forward a little, but at the moment you relax and, or stop paddling your boat, the, the pressure will take you backwards. And that's one of the things that Paul, I believe, is trying to say here to the Corinthians. That living for Christ is not a one and done deal. Salvation, praise God, is an act. It is a one-time act. But sanctification is continuing to paddle your boat upstream and realize that it is through the power of God that we can do that. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Paul was pleading with them to grow out of carnality and become that which is spiritual. I love the way this is put. Paul did not say, I was chiefest of sinners. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am chief. Now, this is important. He didn't say, I was chiefest of sinners. He said, I am. So, don't run away with that. So you're saying, well, is it all right for us to be sinners? No, Paul was simply acknowledging the weakness of his flesh and stating that in this body made out of flesh that has not been glorified yet, that will only happen when we stand face to face with the Lord, that I am still apt to sin. That's part of the battle from spiritual to carnal or carnal to spiritual. So he didn't say I was, he said I am. I looked over in Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah did not say I was undone. He said I am undone. And yes, he received the forgiveness of God, but the point he was making is simply this, that even though I'm saved, and even though the Spirit of God lives in me, and my destiny was changed from hell to heaven the day I got saved, I want to make sure you're with me. If you're saved tonight, do you, rem do you realize that the moment you got saved, that your destiny was changed from hell to heaven? Say amen. amen. But we still live in this world. And we still wear bodies made out of flesh. And we will continually fight the battle. We will continually paddle upstream, if you will. And there will be resistance and there will be conflict. But there's also victory in Jesus because the Holy Spirit of God indwells every one of us that are saved. And he wants us to be spiritual and not carnal did you know that Peter did not say, I was a sinful man? Even after his repentance, he said, I am a sinful man. Realizing the fact that we oftentimes fall into a spirit of carnality. And so, as time gets away so fast, let me just answer this question, where are you? And there's only three possibilities. I love what Pastor Clay said this morning. There's only two kind of people in the world. There's the lost and the saved. And I'm not adding to that, but I do want to say there are three positions. There are three where's that you may be. First of all, you may be lost, never saved, never trusted Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life. It would be kind of rare if you were at a Sunday night service 
having never trusted Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life. But I believe that based on the scripture, that in a congregation this size on a Sunday night, that there's probably somebody here that fits into that category. You've never been saved. You've never been born again. For whatever reason you're here tonight, you're still lost and you're hell bound. But then there's another place. You may be saved and like the people that Paul is preaching to here, you may be saved but carnal. And you're the only one that can answer that question as the Holy Spirit of God deals with you. Saved and carnal. That means that you have more in common with the world than you have in common with God. I could give you many other definitions. But carnal simply means that you measure everything by the world's measuring stick. You measure things by the world's standards, not the standards of the Word of God. That's what carnality is. It is having more in common with the world than you do with God. More in common with the world's people than you do with the people of God. I've had people that actually claim to be Christians that would say something like this, I can't stand to be around them Christians. Well, if you say you can't stand to be around Christians, you might want to check and find out if you is one. Because if you're a true child of God, you ought to desire to be around other people that are saved, that have the same goals and understanding that you do. Carnality raises its head in many ways. And then there's a third group, if you will. Well, first of all, can I say a little bit more about that second group, saved and carnal? That means you're ignoring or rebelling the word, against the Word of God in your relationships, in your home life. Carnality rebels against the Word of God in areas of your life that are clearly, clearly defined in the Word of God. It actually, it just, it shocks me. Now, there are some things that are not as easy to understand in Scripture. I, I understand that. I love to talk to you guys that are studying the Bible and teaching. and Man, I love to visit with you because I learn, uh, I learn from you. There are things that God has revealed to you that, that maybe there's an area that I've not seen. And so I, I want to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ all the time. But we also know there are some things that are so clearly given in Scripture that if you're a true child of God, you cannot claim ignorance. You cannot claim ignorance. You might say, well, what are you talking about? Well, the Bible says, husbands, love your wife even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Okay, now do we have a man here that, that, that has enough courage and spiritual ignorance to stand up and say, I don't know what that means. What does that mean? It means husbands love your wife even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. How can you misunderstand that? Come on, all you men. Well, I, what does that mean? It's a spirit of rebellion when something is clearly written in the Word of God. And that's one of the ways that carnality sticks its head up is when there's something that's so obvious and you still rebel against it. Children, obey your parents. Honor and obey your parents in the Lord. It's the right thing to do. What does that mean? I'm going to blow a gasket, I guarantee it. It means what it says. And, and listen, rebelling against that which is so clearly given is one of the most obvious ways that carnality raises its head. I've had young people say, but yeah, I, I don't think my parents are right on this issue. Did you know that even if your parent is not right, but they're not, they're not asking you to violate the word of, they're not asking you to violate the law. They're, they're just, they may have a different opinion than you, but when you get about 40 years old, you'll realize that they knew a whole lot more than you thought they knew. And when you're in your miserable marriage because you wouldn't listen to your parents or you wouldn't listen to your pastors 
and you're in the middle of a miserable marriage, at that point you'll realize that carnality was running wild back then. Not spirituality, but carnality. Listen, when Pastor Tim and Pastor Clay and some of these men that go to the prison with us, when we get to minister to you in the prison chapel... You might say, that's a little, I mean, you're going, no, I'm not going a little far. I'm telling you, there are people that lived in this community that used to come to this church that we, through the years, have ministered to in the prison chapel because they couldn't stand for somebody to tell them where they were. They rebelled when somebody said, this is where you are. But listen, God loves you, and this is where he wants you to be. And they said, how dare you tell me where I am? I'm going to live my life. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't need anybody telling me where I am. Do you know what Paul said to the Corinthian believers? He said, this is where you are. He said, this is where you are. You're carnal, and I've been giving you milk. I'd like to give you meat, but you can't digest the meat because you're yet carnal. Carnality raises its head in so many ways. You see, then there are those that are truly saved. Those who are being led by the Spirit of God every day. Did you know that being led by the Spirit of God makes you look rather peculiar in this world? Living, being led by God makes you look rather odd in this world. I've had people to ask, like, well, why, why do you do this? Well, if there's a spiritual connotation to it, we try to share with them there's a spiritual connotation. And in this world, applying the Word of God to our daily activities makes us often look strange. When a promotion comes up at work, and you're, maybe the boss comes to you and, and asks about a fellow worker that he's considered for the job, and you are encouraged that that fellow worker might get that promotion and you're you're excited about him getting the promotion and it's not all about me as a child of God that that looks rather strange doesn't it I mean the world says hey listen if the boss is asking for a recommendation why don't you remind him of how long you've been here remind him of the fact that you've never clocked in late kind of toot your own horn but as a child of God, it looks strange when we are willing to give a good report on someone else when you know that that someone else may get a promotion that you'd like to have. It looks strange, doesn't it? Carnality raises its head in many, many ways. So there are those that are truly living for Christ. They're growing spiritually. Not perfect, but desiring to live a spiritual life. Desiring to have the mind of Christ. So as quickly as I can do this, I want to just give you a few things. Miss Megan, if you'll go ahead and make your way to the piano, I'd appreciate it. First of all, if we're going to move from where we are. Now listen, if you can honestly say, and I believe there's a number of people here tonight that can honestly say this, preacher... I'm saved, and I'm studying my Bible, I'm praying, I'm loving my wife, or I'm loving my husband, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do all the things that God... I believe there's a number of people here tonight that you're growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I see it on you, and I praise God when I see you growing in the Lord, living a spiritual life, not a carnal life. But yet at the same time, I'm sure there are numbers here that maybe could not say that. And so, I just want to throw a few things at you here to consider. First of all, if you're saved, the Holy Spirit lives in you. And the Bible says in John 16, 13, that He will guide you into all truth. And I made a note beside that that just simply says, do not resist the guidance of the Holy Spirit. If you're saved tonight because He lives in you, 
you will be convicted of carnality in whatever manner it raises its head. With the Apostle Paul in this particular text, he was talking about divisions. But as you read in 1 Corinthians, he gets into many other things. And, and I believe Pastor Clay mentioned this this morning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was a man living an immoral, ungodly lifestyle in the church. And it was commonly reported, and so Paul addressed that, uh, th that particular manifestation of carnality. So it manifests itself in many ways. But because you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit will convict you. And when he does, do not resist, but repent. Also, it is the desire of your Heavenly Father for you to be a spiritual person and not a carnal person. And then realize you already have, you still have flesh. In 1 Corinthians 9, 27, the Bible says, Paul speaking, he said he had to bring his flesh under subjection every day. You might say the Apostle Paul, yeah, the Apostle Paul struggled with that. He said, I have to keep my body under subjection, the flesh. You see, the battle will rage on. I hope this is not a discouragement to you. But this battle that we are in, this resistance that we feel when we try by the grace of God to live a spiritual life, it will rage on until we awake with the likeness of Christ, according to Psalm 17, 15. We used to sing a song. We seldom sing it anymore. When the battle's over, we will wear a crown. But not until the battle is over. You see, that spiritual person is reminded daily. If you're a spiritual person, you'll be reminded daily of what God has done in your life and what God wants to do tomorrow. I want you to stand with me, and Miss Megan, if you'll wait just a few moments before you play, let's all stand. I read this, and I thought it was so timely. A carnal man wants to succeed and arrive at his goals, but a spiritual man is pressing toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. A carnal man compares himself to others and works to be better than another, while a spiritual man compares himself to Christ and Christ alone and hungers to be more like Christ. A carnal man is goal-oriented in self-help, but a spiritual man is God-oriented in spiritual help. And I love this. I didn't write this. I'm just reading it. He goes to church and says, Preacher, give it all to me. Let me have it. And the kids sing tonight, Preacher, tell it like it is. You see, the carnal man demands what he deserves when he does well. A spiritual man recognizes that God has already given him more than he deserves. My prayer for you tonight as well as for me is that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to tell you where you are. And don't get mad at the Holy Spirit when he tells you wh where you are. If you'll leave, when you go home tonight or maybe at these altars right now, if you ask the Lord, Lord, where am I? It's the same as that prayer in Psalms 139 where he says, Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And if there be any wicked way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. All that is is a prayer that's saying, God, take me from carnal to spiritual. And if you pray that prayer, I can assure you, God will answer that prayer. And he'll show you where you are and lead you to where you need to be. Let's bow our head and close our eyes, Miss Begin, if you'll play. <clears throat> And as it's often stated here, the invitation is not to twist your arm. The invitation is not to try to make you do anything. But I'll just say this, that if the Holy Spirit of God has pricked your heart tonight. And he says, you're lost. You're hell bound. Don't believe the devil right now when he's saying, in response to the Holy Spirit, the devil is saying, yeah, but you're a good person. Yeah, but you attend church and you're a, a good husband or you're a good wife or a good mom or a good dad or a good son or daughter. 
If the Holy Spirit of God has touched your heart tonight and said you are lost and you need Jesus, the Bible says no one can come to the Father except by me. But Jesus is offering the way tonight. Some are at the altars. Do you need to come? Maybe you've got that habit. Maybe you've got that vice that you justify because after all, we're saved by grace and we're kept by grace and God forgives us. Yes, He does. But when the Spirit of God reveals to you that you have that habit or that vice or that pet sin and that other voice on the other shoulder is saying, it's a small thing, don't worry about it. Listen, you'll never move from carnal to spiritual until you listen to that still small voice. She's going to play through one more verse. If you don't come, you're going to close the service. He wants to lead us. He loves you so very much. I, I don't know if you, if you feel this from day to day, but it's such a blessing every day to just feel the love of God and how much He cares about us and loves us. She's going to play through the chorus. Footprints of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. As Pastor Clay said this morning, thank you for your attentiveness and your love for the Word of God. Folks, there's an urgency going on right now. We don't know how much time we've got left, but whatever time we've got left, we need to be willing to serve the Lord uh, with a right spirit. Look forward to seeing all of you on Wednesday evening. Children's program over in the other building at 6.30. Adult Bible study in the sanctuary at 7. And then don't forget to come to the roundup. We're going to have a great time in the Lord. Just a night, would you make your way here uh, to the pulpit, please? I have you two dismiss us in prayer. And uh, Miss Deb's trying to give me a message. Go right ahead, Miss Deb. Which? Okay, those of you that are going to be involved in the Christmas program, Miss Twyla will meet with you wherever. You might say, where? Well, just look at where you are now and follow her which could be dangerous. And then those, those of you that want to meet with Miss Suzanne concerning some plans for you teenagers, that means you folks that are kind of up there in the years, uh, Miss Suzanne will have a meeting over in the other building and just look in the doors until you find her. And uh, so that's good. Anything else? If not, Justin, would you dismiss us, please? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for this evening, this opportunity that we've had to hear your word, Lord. I thank you for Pastor and his studies, Lord, that he prepared to, to help us to be able to search ourselves, Lord. In the Bible, it tells us to search ourselves and to see where we're at, Lord. I pray that we would just be able to give you that, Lord. I know it's hard for us to, to listen to what you have to say and to hear things that we don't want to hear sometimes, Lord, but I just thank you for just... Um, giving us that direction that we need. Lord, I pray that you just help us to do your will this week. Lord, I pray that you be at the roundup and just help everything to go exactly as you would have it to. Lord, we just thank you for all that you do. Forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.